Good morning and welcome to Ordinary Life Online, an educational offering of St. Paul's United Methodist Church. I'm Bill Curley and this is Holly Hudley. And she's going to tell us about our podcast. Yes, we are recording a weekly podcast called In Between because it's in between Sundays, it's in between Bill and me and sometimes other people. And um, we are usually downloading it on Thursdays. It's available on our website or through Apple Podcasts. Ugh, I keep saying I'm going to do it on Spotify and I keep forgetting. I'll get there. <laughs> uh, so please join us. It's a fun time. It is a fun time. And it's also in between a world order that we thought we knew and one that is yet to be. The no We're, longer and the not yet. We are really in between. We're yeah. going to talk about some of that today. Yeah. Okay, so those of you who get the chimes, the uh, online electronic newsletter from St. Paul's, noticed that there was a big ad in the chimes this week for the upcoming Michael Moorwood webinar, which is going to be on Thursday, August the 27th from 7 until... 9. Well, oh, ish. we don't know. Some. <laughs> I thought I was supposed to it's fill in the blank. morning time for him over there. So we, we, we won't know. And so um, immediately uh, I've gotten a lot of emails from people who said they went to the Ordinary Life webpage to register and couldn't. And um, so we, we will have the registration process online by... Wednesday. We're, yes, we, we're going to do some troubleshooting this Monday and then have the link up on, on Wednesday. so that you Because we've register. never done this before. We've never had a webinar with someone in Australia before. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and it's free, so don't worry about you need to get in. You will need to have a registration link to watch the webinar. It'll just be a Zoom link. You'll, we'll, Zoom it'll, link. Yeah, you'll just register on Zoom. We'll get there, we promise, Wednesday. <laughs> and, uh, and the Zoom app for your device is free. You don't even have to have the Zoom app. You can do it through your browser. But it'd be easier, I think, if you had the Zoom app, right? And then in November, or October, October. we're having yeah. Dr. Jackie Lewis. And I really encourage you to go to Collegiate Middle Church in Manhattan and look at what that church is doing and look at the anti-racist program, education program that Jackie Lewis uh, does there. She's going to be here. I heard her speak at a Richard Rohr conference two years ago now, and I, like with Ilya Delio and a lot of the other people that I have met there, I just got smitten with her. Yeah. She's amazing. Yeah. And some of our ordinary life people went to a conference somewhere in North Carolina and heard her. Mm -hmm. And when I talked to Jackie on the phone the other day, I said, by the way, they mentioned that you have music with your program, and she said, oh, yes, I have an album. We'll bring some music. Yeah. Now, how that's going to work out, I don't know. Yeah. But that'll be a Saturday event as if it were happening in this room, and um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Anything else we need to announce? Money? So Yes, sure. If you are inclined to make donations to Ordinary Life, but since we're not in person and can't pass the bowl, you can do it online. On our website is a donate button and you click it. It takes you to the St. Paul's website where you are given, led to a form. And just in the memo, you can put Ordinary Life and it'll go to our account, which goes, all of that money goes towards nonprofits in the Houston area and to our speakers. And this, this is how we give back in Houston is just um, through donations that you guys have made over the years, which we're extremely grateful for. Yep. That it? That's it. Ready, set. So um, <laughs> all of you pajama people or pancake mimosa people or wine and cheese people or wherever you are, I want you to know that no matter who you are, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. As I hope you are aware, we have been doing a series of presentations that we've called Interbeing. This is Holly's title. Holly is uh, well read in Thich Nhat Hanh. Inner being how Jesus and Buddha can guide us through the pandemic. And when we started this, mm. the focus was on the pandemic because the events kicked off by the murder of George Floyd hadn't happened yet. And I might add, eight weeks ago, we didn't have the clarity we have even now about what the future looks like, even though it's still very muddy. 
we're we're in the the midst of something very tragic here. But at least for eight weeks now, we have focused specifically on the teachings of Buddha, uh, specifically found in what's called the Eightfold Path of Buddhism. And today we're bringing that series to a close. And next week we're going to begin um, under the same theme, but we're going to be uh, drawing from the teachings of Jesus as found specifically in the chapters 5, 6, and 7 in Matthew, although we're going to range all over um, the origins of Christianity, trying to understand who Jesus is, his relevance for us, and why it is that we have created it. When you just say the name Jesus, most people go, ooh, ah. uh, don't want to hear that, mm -hmm. or get me out of here, or whatever. So we're, we're going to talk about that. And I have stolen from Marcus Borg, a title for next Sunday called Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time. So Borg's books, uh, Borg is the, Borg died three years ago now, but he um, he and John Dominic Crossan are probably the living, uh, uh, the authorities on Jesus in, in the English speaking world. And Borg has a book on Jesus, The Heart of Christianity, which is very uh, good to read. And he also has that book, Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time. So, I stole that from him. Um, today, we're calling this last talk on the Eightfold Path, the spiritual dark matter that holds it all together. The um, eighth of the Eightfold Path is called Right Concentration. Now, I would review very briefly that the Eightfold Path consists of these eight things, and the top two, right understanding and thought, are things that emphasize um, wisdom teachings. The next four, speech, action, livelihood, uh, and, and next three, I'm sorry, represent morality teachings. And then the next three represent um, concentration or mental discipline trainings that are necessary. And um, right concentration is about how we use the mind and the brain to apprehend and then to express matters of the Spirit. And I will have to say that this particular topic has been a primary preoccupation of mine since I was 12 or 13 years old. Seriously. Um, if, if I had looked back in on my life as a kid and seeing that this 12-year-old boy was reading books on peace of mind and so forth, I would think, we got to get that family would into you therapy. Would you say, here's a Superman comic? Baby. Yeah, here's yeah, a comic yeah, book. Yeah. To read that. Yeah. <laughs> but as as I have grown over the years, both in information and knowledge about matters of the mind, what I have and I hope I have gained some wisdom and understanding as well. What I have grown to know is that that the more we know, the more we know that we don't know about how the brain, how the mind uh, functions, how it works. It is uh, as complicated as the cosmos, mm -hmm. if not more so. And I know because of my training in psychology and my experience with Jungian analysis, that all of us in the process, <clears throat> as we put it, of growing up, we've developed defenses mm -hmm. um, with which to deal with the world as we perceive it and experience it. And we do not <clears throat> without much hard work, see the world as it is. And that, I think, is what right concentration is all about. We are all trapped by our personality. Now, if you think what I said, just said, doesn't apply to you, that's an indication that you're really trapped. We're all trapped. Last week, I told the story, the Sufi story about the man who was in prison and who found freedom <clears throat> by accepting a gift of a prayer rug from his wife and doing the work that he needed to be free of prison. The Sufi teaching story is a parable. The woman in the story is Sophia or wisdom. Wisdom is a word that, Sophia is a word that Jesus used for God. The man had to make friends of the shadow aspects of his personality to experience some sort of integration so that he could step into freedom. Um, by the way, what's true for that individual 
What's true for me as an individual and true for you as an individual is also true for social groups, families. It's true for cultures. It's true for countries. We have had 200 years plus of cultural idolatry in this country where we have been taught to believe that our country fell straight from heaven and that we are God's chosen people. And that if everybody did it just like we do it, did, the world would be fine. Look at how we're handling COVID to see about that. We've become like a third world country. The woman in this story, as I said, represents wisdom. That's in the Jewish tradition. And as I said last week, finding this freedom doesn't come easy. And it is not something that is accomplished once and for all. It's like peeling the layers of an onion or as Holly put it earlier when we started talking about the Eightfold Path, it's like ascending and descending a spiral staircase at the same time. Well, which, I got that from you. <laughs> <laughs> which is a really paradoxical, which is what non-dual mind is, right. is all about, about getting into that paradoxical thing. So... Freedom is not something we accomplish once and for all. I am not familiar with all the world's religions, but the ones I am familiar with uh, all have some teachings about how we fall away from our essential selves, our true essence. And when we do that, we then develop the capacity to do things to ourselves and to others that can become really horrible things. We can become hard and cynical at seeing others as object to be, objects to be defended against or as things to be used for our own gratification. And we frequently, great metaphor of Jesus used over and over, we frequently fall asleep to our true nature and we have to be involved in the work to wake up. Um, I used last week the metaphor of a wave, which I got from Thich Nhat Hanh. A wave has no individual existence. It comes into existence from the ocean and passes back into the ocean. So right concentration is about developing the ability to bring more and more of our awareness, not only to the reality of the self, but also to the essence in which we live and move and have our being. We still function in the world as individual waves, but with an ever-growing awareness of our connection to sacred mystery. We become aware that we are part of the mystery and that the mystery is both around and within us. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, Hafiz has a wonderful line. I am a hole in the flute that, the, that Christ's breath moves through. Listen to this music. I think Jim Finley, whom I will quote later uh, today at length, says, God is the singer. We are the song. We are the thought God is having. Now, I hope you understand that's really metaphorical, uh, poetic language. Don't take it literally, but it's just true. Um, our task is to stay open to this identity. Mm -hmm. So when we get to talking about the the teachings of Jesus next week, one of the things that we're going to pay attention to is how can we live in the world as it is um, with the various roles that we have to play in the world to uh, have a life, have a living, to have a family, to provide for ourselves and others. How can we live in the world without losing our identity as God's thought at, at, at the same time? In their book on the Enneagram, uh, Riso and Hudson say, it is though we were living, we were given a mansion to live in with rich furnishings and beautifully kept grounds, but we have confined ourselves to a small dark closet in the basement. Most of us have forgotten that the rest of the mansion even exists or that we are its owner. <clears throat> so, we fall asleep to ourselves and undertaking any of the practices that would be included in right concentration will show you how much we are preoccupied with thoughts and worries and mental pictures of all sorts. We are seldom present to our immediate experience. Uh, one of the ways to describe Buddhism is that it is focused on helping people be free from cravings and aversions. And of course, you can't be free from something unless you first notice how trapped you are by it. One of my favorite quotes by Carl 
call you is the privilege of a lifetime is to become who you truly are. Hmm. So our personality sets up defenses, but it also frees us. It's a tool. Yeah, yeah. That can be used to trap or to set us free. Mm -hmm. You're just saying in Thomas about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My favorite. Maybe I should do. Maybe I should do something on I, Thomas I, someday. Yeah, I've heard that's a good one. Um, so I wanted to give us a little bit of grounding on the title of this talk. So dark matter is one of the great mysteries of of the universe. You got that? And one of the least understood. Even if we think we know something, so for example, how to solve a math equation or how to talk about science or physics, even as I try to talk about dark matter, I'm understanding that I don't really know what it is. And the words that we put around something are metaphors to help us relate to it in some ways. So words themselves become a kind of way of relating. David Abrams said of words that it's no more true that we speak than that the animate world speaks within us. What we speak and how we speak has an impact on all of that. So similarly, we only know dark matter by its impact on things it interacts with. It speaks through visible matter. Turns out that only 68%, or sorry, roughly, this is not only, 68% of the universe is dark energy and 27% more is considered dark matter. So the rest, which leaves us 5%, is normal matter. That's, we can see 5% of the known universe. That's amazing. I know, which makes it like, why is that called normal matter, <laughs> right? Why is dark matter and dark energy not what we consider normal? Um, because we can't see it. And so this is the, it, it is, Un, it's not easy to call it normal because, we, because of that. So in some ways, it's easier to talk about what dark matter isn't than what it is. It isn't in the form of a star. It isn't a black cloud. It is not antimatter. It is not a black hole. <laughs> it is not evil, despite the name dark matter. It's just not visible to us. It's okay to just go to the next one. So there's a really cool thing about our bodies and their relationship to the world around us. We, our bodies are essentially reciprocal mirrors of the cosmos. Like the planet, for example, our bodies are made up of 70% water, and a single cell dividing resembles the birth of a star. I can really, really geek out on these things, so I'll spare you, because <laughs> I can keep going. Um, but, you know, uh-oh, sorry. I'm on my wrong page. <laughs> but anyways, suffice to say that what I have read as an explanation of dark matter is that it's called the stuff that keeps the universe from flying apart. We have something like this in our bodies that can't be seen very well and we don't know very much about, but we know it's there because of the way it acts upon us. It has, of course, always been there, but scientists are only just discovering how it works and what it is, and they're calling it the interstitium. This is a, cell, a, a microscopic picture of what, 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 what the interstitium is. It's a fluid-filled network that works between our body spaces, between our organs, muscles, cells. Essentially, it keeps us from flying apart, like dark matter. Inside of our body is this entire universe held together by a mysterious substance that scientists are only just starting to get a clearer picture of. So what does any of this have to do with right concentration or the Eightfold Path? I want to offer that these teachings, and later as we get into the teachings of Jesus, can keep us from flying apart. In this particular time, I am going to guess, or maybe I'm projecting here, but I think most of us have felt maybe two or three or 20 times like we were wanting to fly apart. It's been I think a time full of uncertainty and grief and anxiety and uh, just a lot of not knowing. And exhaustion. Exhaustion, exhaustion for the waiting of when, what's next, right? I don't think we can return to normal, but I think we can create a new normal. So for me, that day, that feeling of flying apart came acutely, the day I saw the footage of Ahmaud Arbery and then George Floyd, Floyd being murdered. I saw those two on the same day or within 24 hours of each other. I was angry 
and sad and I didn't want to engage at that time with even my closest friends. Like we were getting a lot of texts and I just, I didn't even want to engage. Alongside their deaths came a flurry of other videos of black bodies being killed or mistreated. I spent, I think, weeks in a fog and in some ways still feel like that's really permeating through me. Not because I was in disbelief, which is its own sad state of affairs that I could believe that this is possible and continue to believe that it's possible for black men to die unjustly. But because I felt like Josh and I, my husband, and I had to use every tool that we had to keep our kids and ourselves from flying apart. We had to have our own big feelings and trying to assure our boys that they are beautiful and safe and loved. One of these things did not feel entirely true. But how as a parent do we help our kid feel free and easy in their body when the world is pressing in on bodies that look like theirs? Our willingness to confront what keeps things like racism, oppression, and fear alive contributes to their feeling free and easy in their body. We are accountable more than probably anything else to our kids. If you're seeing me for the first time, you might wonder why I, a white woman, am saying all of this. For clarity, my husband is black and my kids are black, white, biracial. That's a great photo, by the way. <laughs> this is them, free and easy in their bodies, yeah. right? Um, and many white folks I know feel sad and frustrated and even guilty that my family has to address issues that might be different than what their families have to address. And they've asked for help in understanding these issues. And part of the fog was this deep sadness that most white families I know were not given the tools to talk about this with their children or with each other. And so this feeling is that it doesn't apply to them. What can I do for you since I'm not going through this? But I, I wanna say it applies to all of us. This, this feeling of unrest applies to all of us and that's what we must address. Many of my white friends have felt pained or a uh, real deep sense of grief and also shaken awake. But I think that what we feel for our three boys is a certain kind of fear that the world won't see them as beautiful and free and safe. Someone sent me a photo of a spray painted saying on a sidewalk that said, black boys don't dream, they're too busy living nightmares. I don't think any of us would say we want this to be true. And I'm not trying to exploit your emotions in talking about my kids and my husband, but I am trying to say that my deep love for them has shaken me awake, has allowed me to have a deeper understanding of the things that our society need to deal with. I'd like to impose on us, I think, that though we don't have, we don't have to know or be friends with a single person of color, a single Mexican immigrant, a single Syrian refugee, to know that we have issues we need to deal with, issues of inequity and oppression. I know I wasn't given the tools to talk about this stuff growing up. I've had to learn them, and in learning how not to, and learning how to deal with them, I've had to learn how not to be in denial, how to like loosen defensiveness, and how to sit with discomfort. I, I think a big awakening is like this feeling of being duped that the system that I was taught to believe in does not, in fact, work for everyone. So I'm not done with any of this work. I think we're, all, you know, this is a continuum. It's like the eightfold path. It's a lifelong process of going deeper, coming back to the light, going deeper, coming back to the light. This is maybe one of the greatest gifts of something like the Eightfold Path. It doesn't excuse indifference. It doesn't give anyone an out to say, well, this doesn't apply to me. It's grounded in the belief that both our liberation and our suffering are bound up together. This is what Thich Nhat Hanh calls interbeing. That's the essence of interbeing. To bring this back to the Sufi story that you mentioned and um, told last week, interbeing means we need to see ourselves in every single aspect of that story. And we are the guard, we are the prisoner, we are the wife, we are the wisdom. We need to see ourselves to bring it to this moment in George Floyd and as hard as it is in Derek Chauvin. And how we might have looked the other way as systems arose around us that kept, that didn't support everyone. 
We need to see ourselves as a young woman who took the video of George Floyd's death and called over and over and over again for these four cops to stop. I think of her trauma, right? Seeing something like that. And in the protesters who have taken to the streets, as well as in the bystanders, I mean, I think you see where I'm going with this. We need to see ourselves in every aspect of the story and position ourselves to be able to fully understand what is going on and how we might participate in changing it. How we might participate in creating or imagining a world that all of us would want to be part of. So this is a kind of spiritual exercise, seeing yourself in every part of a story. And the Eightfold Path can help us see the reality for what it is and hold both love and accountability in the same hand. I want us to see ourselves in my children and so many other black and brown children and transgender children and immigrant children, all of those who have been cast aside so that the only option we're left with is using all the powers of our mind and of our hearts to create the world, as I said, that we want to live in. A world where I'm not lying to my boys when I say, you are safe, baby, you are safe. We need to tend to all of the bodies that do not feel a sense of safety and belonging. There are so many. I wanna create a world where we tend to that connective tissue that interstitial space between us, or the dark matter that keeps us from flying apart. Thich Nhat Hanh refers to right, uh, right concentration as limitless consciousness. At first, he says, we only see individual consciousness. But then as we go deeper into right concentration, we see that consciousness is earth, water, air, fire, and space. What is true of infinite faith, space is also true of consciousness. Everything is in everything. So when Holly and I are preparing for these times together, our work is collaborative, and that collaboration takes many different forms. Including text. <laughs> I think this is where the podcast came from. Yeah. That you wanted to record our conversations that we had. Yeah, yeah, kind of. We thought, it, yes. You, you had this thought of yeah, yeah. doing that. And so um, I, as you know, what I'm trying, what we're trying to say is that right concentration is the glue that holds all the eightfold path together, yes. right? And, and, and so it's somehow, sometime during this process this week, I started thinking about your field of expertise, and I ask you a question. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know that we're going to go rote through what I've <laughs> captured, but uh, when I was in when I was in graduate school, which was uh, uh, in the fifties and sixties, yeah. I went to seminary, uh, graduated from Baylor, and then went to the seminary where I spent the rest of my life. It felt like, <laughs> but. Um, just coming onto the horizon in my academic world was a thing called the sociology of knowledge. And there were people like Robert Bella mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, Peter Berger mm -hmm. who were writing in this field. And wow, they were teaching that what we, the world we live in is a construct of our imagination. Yeah. And so I ask you, and what arose out of that was, okay, did we construct God? Did we construct the notion of God? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I Which asked, came first kind of question, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the answer is? <laughs> well, my, the answer that I take on is that, you know, so uh, pure cosmologists, pure scientists usually keep their talk away from God. They don't, and yet, like, there are those who are bridges. I think Einstein, for example, was one of these bridges who believed in mystery and believed that all things were mysterious. Um, and, the, and so then as we see this evolution of consciousness, we can also perceive these abstractions, like God, love, mystery, infinity. Infinity is an abstraction, and yet we have an equation for it, right? Right. So these are, but all of these for me are congruent, meaning I think, and I think where science is headed today is that the, at least those who are interested in sort of holding mystery and knowledge in the same, in, in these two balanced positions, and also religion that is interested in creating a more scientific religion, right, a religion based on what is, 
are able to hold these two things together a little bit. We're, we're, we're learning, right? And what I said to you is that I think that these things co-arose. So, um, I think that they're completely a mutual co arising Co-evolution. Yes. Okay. So, um, it, it, you know, I've talked some about the first actual age mm -hmm. and um, a Greek philosopher and theologian who I would put in the group that belongs to the first actual age mm -hmm. because he worked around 500 B.C. So that that's in that general uh, area where the... Jewish prophets and Confucius and other right. people were, were doing their work. I don't know how to pronounce his name, Zonophys. I don't know how you say that. Uh, but he, he wrote, he's considered probably the most important pre-Socratic pre philosopher mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. And he wrote, but if cattle and horses and lions had hands or could paint with their hands and create works as men do, Horses like horses and cattle like cattle also would depict the God shapes and make their bodies of such a sort that they form themselves. And the way this meme shows up on the Internet is if horses had gods, they would like look like horses. True. So we have created an anthropomorphic understanding of a God mm -hmm. who is male, mm -hmm. white, mm -hmm. out there, mm -hmm. angry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Usually, huh? Usually, or else texting while they're in our own apart. image. That is our own image. <laughs> yes. Unless we yeah. wake up. Well, and I think I used I used to really reject this sort of anthropomorphic idea of God, but I think that as I, it's it's not so much anthropomorphism that I'm coming around to. It's yes, we do need to see ourselves in this. We do need to see ourselves. So if we think God is distant and angry, what does that say about what we think about us? Yeah. Yeah. We, okay, so I just was trying to get clear. Yeah. yeah, You know, we have on the masthead of the email that we send out twice a week, yeah. this line from Adeline Watts, through our eyes, the universe is perceiving itself. Through our ears, the universe is listening to its harmonies. We are the witnesses through which the universe becomes conscious of its glory, mm -hmm. of its magnificence. Mm -hmm. So I remember reading or hearing Brian Swim say that as humans evolved, they discovered that they had ears, we yep. discovered, right. so that we needed to hear stuff. Mm -hmm. and we created music. So I have a different thing, th take on that. Okay. We, our ears evolved, we could hear the music of the universe, and in creating music, we tried to mimic it. Oh, that's better. We heard birds, we heard coyotes, we heard the wind, and in creating music. That's better, I like we, that better. We, we were letting the universe pour, pour forth. So I think, you know, for me, this, co this, uh, this capacity of the human to create, we need always to stay mindful of the fact that what we say verbally is merely a representation of what we think right. is true. Right. And in the, for me, this in, in trying to really embody non-dual mind, Anytime you say spirit came first or matter came first, you're perpetuating dualism. And so my thought is, why does it have to be one or the other? This co-arising of consciousness and matter mm -hmm. and our experience of it is no less awesome. Right. You know, to me. <laughs> we know so little. We know so little. So uh, one of the things I would like uh, us to be mindful of, everybody to be mindful of as we go forward, particularly in talking about um, Jesus and his teachings, are the assumptions that we bring mm -hmm. to the table. Well, and one of the greatest assumptions we do bring, and that is both based on our um, personality defenses and um, our sort of, what do you want to say, our separation from the mother even. It, it gives us the illusion that there's a separate self. And I think the Eightfold Path and the teachings of Jesus actually work to teach us, no, 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 there is no separate self. There's autonomy and individuality, but you are not separate from all that is. And, and I think that's how I understand that sort of autonomy and embeddedness of reality. 
We, you have Bill, I have Holly, but we are embedded in the same reality. And, and I'm going to say mm -hmm. that almost all the problems that we have mm -hmm. come from the notion, uh, come from a belief of separate self. Yeah. All of them. Right. So the Eightfold Path gives us this ability to attune ourselves back to the sacred, back to that wholeness. Right. And when I think of sacred mystery, I think of it like a sacred wholeness. And so, you know, very quickly when we use right mind and right concentration, we become aware that everything is a reflection of the sacred. As you said, if horses created gods, they would have looked like horses. Mm -hmm. So can we as humans with consciousness see that God is in the horse? God is a horse. <laughs> Didn't you write a letter once that said God is a chicken? <laughs> We'll get there later. Anyways, <laughs> part of, I think, what this apocalyptic time does is this great reveal is show us this messy underbelly of just how much we've tried to keep hidden from view. The poor, the undocumented, those without adequate health care, housing, education, how harmful racism is. And, and with this reveal happening, it's all bubbling up to the surface and forcing us to recognize that we're we're both part of the problem and part of the solution. If we listen, if we really tune our ears to the music of these raised voices, to mother's tears of a planet hurting, I think we can hear the beauty in the broken. If we can attend to practicing the skills of the heart and mind and help us notice that which is so often unseen actually does impact our lives we could bring about what I think of as like a mystical revolution, whose battle cry is, I am not you, I am not other than you. James Baldwin wrote in The Devil Finds Work, to encounter oneself is to encounter the other, and this is love. If I know that my soul trembles, I know that yours does too. And if I can respect this, both of us can live. In the meantime, these same skills can help us to hold the heavy and sit with the discomfort. They're useful at every stage of transformation, from dealing with what is to growing hope or growing our ability to participate in the needs for change. I realize I've given you know, kind of an impassioned speech about why we need dark matter <laughs> and the interstitium, also about why we need interbeing to be at a felt, to be like at the level of felt reality. But here's one very, very practical tool that I think we could try for throughout the week. And just notice what it does for you. We can't get close enough right now to hug or touch or even shake hands in many circumstances. But try this, when we are around people, look them in the eye. Look at creatures, at caterpillars, at bees and your dog. Look at babies, look at people you pass, and look them in the eye and say, even if only to yourself, namaste. Which means the God in me sees the God in you. I'm beginning to believe that our greatest technology as human beings, the thing we have right at our fingertips, is not our cell phone with all of Google's answers and Siri's ability to help us with whatever we need, but that it's love. And I want to imagine a world where love is the stuff that keeps us from flying apart. So, okay. I really struggle with this next section and um, I probably will not stay close to my notes because mm -hmm. I don't know how to do it. Right concentration is the foundation for the mindfulness that will enable us to master the other seven steps on the Eightfold Path. Mm -hmm. And there are so many ways to step into what we're trying to say right now that it is overwhelming to try to enumerate them all. I am talking about concrete, specific practices that people do on a regular basis. Right concentration is about practice. And when I have had counselees or directees who have asked a question about, well, how can I do and I say I want you to have a daily spiritual practice I say it a lot I say it all, I say it to the point that I get teased about it yeah it's just because we're trying <laughs> <laughs> so somebody says uh, I'll say this I'll give this advice and, and let's say two or three 
months pass, and they, they come back and I say, "How's your spiritual practice going?" And I said, "Well, I didn't. I, I quit." What happened? Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't working. How long did you do it? Oh, two or three weeks. And my temptation is to say, "Look, do it for two years, and then come back and let's talk." Yeah. You got to do it every day, every. Yeah, the way that I sort of imagine a spiritual practice that we sort of separate time out from, which sounds counterintuitive to non-duality, but the reason that separating the time is important is so that our spiritual practice eventually becomes infused with our daily life, that life becomes our practice. That is, that is exactly yeah. well put. Yeah. That's well put. So... Um, Practice can take many different shapes and forms, but you can't, let, let's make it analogous to um, dental hygiene. I brush my teeth once a year. <laughs> just kidding. But this just, guy, you, this yeah. But guy goes to the dentist and the dentist says, do you floss? And he says, yes, I floss religiously every Easter and Christmas. Yeah. 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 You have to floss every day. Right. You have to. Or if you want to keep your body in good physical shape, you have to get your body into some physical activity and nutritious eating program. Which is what the Buddha and Jesus both learned in their time uh, away. Uh, away. I can't not tend to my body. We have to attend to our physicality. That's why we can't separate spirit and matter. The matter needs attention as much as the soul. You know, I talked at length in here uh, last year or whenever it was about Bruce Chilton's book called Rabbi Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's probably the best uh, account of a, an active imagination understanding based on his scholarship. He's a member of the Jesus Seminar. And based on his scholarship of how this human being Jesus got born into the world, how he grew the family, the socioeconomic circumstance in which he grew, left home at about 12 or 13, got into um, John the Baptist's enclave, stayed with him for years, uh, and they developed these mystical ritual practices. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you read the New Testament, which is not a biography of Jesus, but I mean, if you read the Jesus narratives, just pay attention to how much time he spent in prayer, his advice about praying mm -hmm. and his reliance on sacred mystery. Uh, it's staggering. Mm -hmm. He spent a lot of time mm -hmm. having a spiritual practice. And then he went and raised hell. I mean, <laughs> you know, he turned <laughs> He got money. in good trouble. He got in he good, got trouble, good trouble like that. So, <laughs> I want to encourage you to have a daily practice and train your mind to be less reactive. Now, there are so many books on this. You could go to a bookstore. You could look on Amazon, books about meditation or having a spiritual practice. I want to say a few things about practicality. Mm -hmm. Do it once a day, twice a day if you can. Uh, start with a short period of time, maybe 10 or 15 minutes a day, gradually increase it. I find it's helpful to me to have a, a place, and I've varied that over the years uh, where I, I do that. Um, posture, don't worry about that. Wor work about what keeps you awake and work. do what works best. And if you don't like to sit, uh, don't sit. Walk. Have a walking meditation. Thich Nhat Hans has a great piece in his book about pieces every step about walking meditation. Um, difficulties, expect them. It's not easy work, right concentration. And probably the most helpful form of meditation practice, it's the largest meditation movement in the world called insight meditation or Vipassana meditation, um, is a... Um, is a meditation that helps people learn simply to stay. That's what Pima Chodron says. You say to yourself over and over, just stay, just stay. And pay attention to your breath or to counting. Pay attention to the thoughts that come and go, but learn to become observer to your own process, to know what shows up and to deal with it and not be reactive. I love Thich Nhat Hanh's line, that when anger shows up, he says, open the door and let anger in and say, come in and have a seat by me. I'll take good care of you. 
and to be non-reactive uh, that way. Why are you here? Mm. We began that, our class last week with those questions. Why are we here? Why are we doing this? And we are doing this for the liberation of all that is and all who are. Uh, another resource for this is go back to the strong book, 12 Steps to a Compassionate Life. Read the chapter on praying the four immeasurables. That's it's a great spiritual practice to undertake and to build on what Holly was saying. When you see people on the street, you don't have to say anything out loud, but just pick somebody and say, may you be filled with loving kindness and compassion. May you be well, may you be peaceful and at ease. I was going to show the tree of contemplative practices, <laughs> just, just but it went moment, away. We lost them. Um, um, okay, we'll yeah, get there. Yeah. So when it, to wear a mask. Yeah. one of the, you know, it, the tree of contemplative practices we'll definitely include in our, uh, maybe we'll put as the picture to release this podcast, but there's just so many, so many practices between walking, writing, art making, reading, uh, being in presence to something else or someone else. I have found that one of the greatest gifts of as Pima Chodron says, just letting things in, is an ability to deal with conflict, which like nobody really likes conflict, right? <laughs> nobody likes getting in a fight with their spouse or yelling at their children, which I never do. But, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but staying with what is keeps us in the room when things get hard. Mm -hmm. And we're in a hard time right now. So I think tending to that spiritual practice is inviting yourself to stay in the room with the difficulty of what is. You know, why does a word have an itch on my chin? Why does a word like white privilege get us? If we stay with it, we invite it in. We begin to unpack it and realize that, ah, oh, this is what that means. And one of the should I move on to? Yeah, okay. go ahead. Since we don't have our picture. <laughs> we don't know. Okay. Um, one of the things, and actually I just think a lot of this becoming part of my practice is a gratitude to Sherry Beeman, Bill's beautiful bride, as he refers to her often, which is using poetry as a spiritual practice. For me, it's, um, it's accessible. Uh, my life moves in fast chunks with three little kids. Poetry is one I can do relatively quickly and get a lot out of. And we both love Huffies. I love Huffies. I re and that's, that's another part of a practice yeah. that Sherry and I do. Uh, and most every day we read from uh, a book called The Gift. Big, I big. love The Gift. I have it. Yeah. Oh, I also have, a, I heard God laughing. Yeah. And the, um, uh, Love Letters from God, which you introduced to our class a couple of years ago. Yeah. And I went and bought, have bought it for friends. Yeah. Um, but this poem is beautiful. It's called, if it is, and this is it again, like this poem found me this week. It seems perfect. If it is not too dark, go for a walk if it is not too dark. Get some fresh air. Try to smile. Say something kind to a safe looking stranger if one happens by. I, p I put safe looking in parentheses because I say just find a stranger. <laughs> it's all right if they're not entirely safe looking because then we get into some other issues. Always exercise your heart's knowing. You might as well attempt something real along this path. Take your spouse or your lover into your arms the way you did when you first met. Let tenderness pour from your eyes the way the sun gazes warmly on the earth. Play a game with some children. Extend yourself to a friend. Say, sing a few ribald songs to your pets and plants. Why not let them get drunk and wild? Let's toast every rung we've climbed on evolution's ladder. Whisper, I love you, I love you, to the whole mad world. Let's stop reading about God. We will never understand him. Jump to your feet, wave your fists, threaten and warn the whole universe that your heart can no longer live without real love. Thanks, Hafiz. So um, that's the Eightfold Path. We're done. <laughs> well, we did a uh, version of it. Yeah. There's actually in Thich Nhat Hans, if you want to further reading around it, 
Thich Nhat Hanh's book, the, the Heart of the Buddha's Teachings, is so lovely because there's actually, most of the book is about the prayers and the actual meditations that are used in the, along the Eightfold Path. So there's a description of each step along the Eightfold Path, but then there's all these prayers and meditations and chants that are used and sort of getting And the book there. is about much more than that. Oh, yes. It's about interbeing. Yeah. And this is just a strategy. I think that uh, th that's certainly not the first book of Thich Nhat Hans that I read. I think it may be his best. I don't mm. know. What do you think? Um, I really like it. I also really like Interbeing, which is a smaller volume, but um, solely about this. I think yeah. the first of his I read was Pieces Every Step. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's, that mm -hmm. was good. Mm -hmm. Well, we seem to have lost our technical part. All right. So I, I just want to close this part of this eight-week series on um, how Buddha and Jesus can help us na navigate the pandemic mm -hmm. by saying that, that we want these teachings to be relevant and applicable in light not only of the pandemic, pandemic but also how we deal with systemic racism in this country. And one of the things that's been revealed to us in this time, and it's why doing this rethinking is so relevant, to now we're going to rethink Jesus in this when we yeah. come up next, in light of this particular thing. Yeah. Because what this pandemic and, and what um, the revelation of the systemic racism has uncovered is... Um, what people who have been oppressed and marginalized have known all along. Mm -hmm. And that is that the injustice, they've known about the injustice and unsustainability of the old order. So we're in a time when something new is being born. I've never done what you women can do. Given birth. Given birth. It's a great metaphor. It and hurts. only half of the population can do it. it and hurts. it hurts like hell. <laughs> yes. So they don't call it labor pains for nothing. And we are, we're giving birth to something new. It's an induction into the kind of reality that parenting is. And parenting is a metaphor for how to grapple with pain and deep love at the same time, I think. So all of this week, uh, past week, Richard Rohr's Daily Meditations has been about mystics and mysticisms. And, and as Holly just demonstrated, poets are mystics. Mm -hmm. And uh, not all poets are mystics, but many of them are. And Alfred Tennyson wrote a poem in which he said, Our little systems have their day. They have their day and cease to be. They are but broken lights of thee. And thou, O Lord, are more than they now, I just read this week from another source, some uh, respected theologian say, the virus is God's way of ending consumerism. It is the end of natural, of the narrative of globalism. Now, I don't believe that theology. I don't have that theology as part of me. I don't think it's accurate. But I do know what that person was trying to say. He was trying to say that our business as usual story, to use Joanna Mays' phrase, is doomed to fail. Our using up the resources of the earth and our indifferent, in our indifferent indulgence is doomed to fail. These behaviors will fail because they contradict the given reality of creation. We do not find God or sacred mystery apart from any aspect of creation or apart from any creature, human or otherwise. Over the years, I have heard Jim Finley say over and over that God gives God's self away in the reality of all things. It's our loss, says Finley, that we do not know that we are the generosity of God. Uh, listen to that again. It is our loss that we do not know that we ourselves are the generosity of God. We attended a conference a few years ago where Jim Finley was the featured teacher. And the conference is called Following the Mystics Through the Narrow Gates. And it was a conference that focused on Meister Eckhart, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila. And you can go to the Center for Action and Contemplation website, go to their bookstore, and you can buy that conference on CDs. I highly recommend it. Uh, Jim Finley is a wonderful teacher. And um, 
In that course, he used an analogy that I'm going to try to recreate. This is Jim Finley's work. Some of these are my words. He said, imagine that you are standing before a full length mirror and imagine that the image of you that you are seeing in the mirror is conscious and that it can think. Now, the image of you has been through a lot of therapy. It's taken a lot of courses on being an insightful image. And it's come to a point in which it informs you that it doesn't need you anymore. <laughs> and you say to the image, well, you know, this is going to be really hard for you, really love, rough, because you are an image of me. And so to gently help the image out, you step halfway away from the mirror off to the side and uh, half of the image disappears and the image has a panic attack and gets back into therapy and says to the therapist, I'm not real, I'm not real, I was working on my affirmations, I bolstered up my confidence, I don't know where I went, I just buckled. Now, mm -hmm. says Finley, the image was real, but it was an image of you. It wasn't real in the way that the image thought it was real. It was real, but it wasn't real without you. It was real as an image of you. You get it? We are an image of sacred mystery, and we are not real without being a reflection of that, of that reality. So right concentration provides the tools we need to stay in touch with our true identity. Buddhism says that who we are is who we are, the self is within us. And Jesus says that who we are is who we are in relationship to that sacred mystery, who is also hidden within. But we wander off the path of knowing this, and it takes effort to get back on the path. Fortunately, there are guides to follow, and the Eightfold Path is one of these. Jesus, whose teachings we will pick up on next week, uh, is another wonderful tool and technique offering us a path to follow. Reclaiming the identity of the true self who we are in relation to the sacred can sustain us during this time of pandemic and as we grapple with issues of justice in our culture. Do the work to hang on to that. Mm. Or you can simplify it into two sentences. We are who we are in God, no more, no less. Thank you. Yeah. I love doing this with you. Me too. Remember, no matter who you are, no matter where you go this week, watch your step because you carry precious cargo, and we will see you here next Sunday. Be back with Jesus.